there have been many remarkable transitions and changes in the history of life on Earth. But one of them that we're going to talk about here is the rise of multicellularity. What do we mean by a multicellular organism? Well, we mean an organism where the cells have differentiated into specialized functions. For example, we are multicellular organisms. We have cells that do uh, bone structures. We have cells that are skin cells. We have cells that form the liver and the heart. All the cells do different things, but they all communicate with each other in the totality of the organism. A multicellular organism is an organism that contains cells that are specialized and carry out particular functions, but all communicate to create a total organism. This is an unusual way of doing life. For about three billion years, all life on Earth was microbial, unicellular, single-celled organisms forming these stromatolites that we saw earlier, or these microbial mats, just collections of undifferentiated microorganisms simply reproducing and producing the same cells as they uh, grow in particular environments. The controversial evidence for these very early life forms is in the fossil record, and we've talked about that already, also chemical signatures. But all of this evidence, and it gets better as time goes on through the history of life on Earth, gives us this knowledge that for about three billion years, life just continued being unicellular. And then something remarkable happened, a complete change. Between about 585 million years ago and 542 million years ago, the Ediacia and fauna, which are fossils in the rock record that suggest the first multicellular organisms, and these fossils are very enigmatic. We don't really understand them. Some of them have strange frond shapes. Some of them have strange tubular shapes. They seem to be experiments, experiments in early body plans as cells began to differentiate, become more specialized, and form larger, complex organisms that would ultimately lead to the multicellular life that we know on Earth today. They were first uh, discovered in Australia. This is an artist's impression of these fauna as they've been found in the rock record and what they might have looked like in these early environments over 500 million years ago. And you can see these strange three-dimensional shapes that suggest these early experiments and different body plans as life began to emerge from its unicellular state to complex multicellular organisms with specialized body plans and cells forming specialized parts of the different organisms. So an obvious question for astrobiologists is how did this multicellularity arise and why did it arise? Well, it still remains controversial. And in fact, the rise of multicellularity is one of the great puzzles in astrobiology and one of the great puzzles for biologists. Here are some possible examples of ways in which this might have occurred. There may have been some sort of genetic change. At some point in the early history of life, in the early history of those multicellular organisms, the genetic material of DNA, uh, DNA changed and there was a mutation that led to specialization of cells. So what were unicellular, non-specialized cells, the genetic information changed. They mutated and some cells became specialized to do one function and some cells carried on doing another function, but they remained in communication, so they remained in a complete organism. Well, why would this occur in the first place? We don't really understand. Maybe it was something to do with the complexity of genetic material, genetic information that triggered at some particular point in the history of life this uh, complexity in the genetic code that allowed for this differentiation to have occurred. Another possibility is not just changes internally in the genetic information, but also changes in the environment. For example, the rise of oxygen might have been important for multicellular life. Why would that have been the case? Well, once we have oxygen in the atmosphere, we can do aerobic respiration. That's the way in which you and I make energy. We essentially burn organic carbon, for example, in our sandwiches, using oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. And that releases a tremendous amount of energy, energy that can be used to run, to jump, and even to power the human brain. And that's the same for other multicellular organisms as well. Without oxygen, the sorts of metabolisms, the sorts of ways in which life can get energy are much less energy efficient than aerobic respiration. 
So the rise in oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere might have been one of the triggers that allowed for complex uh, organisms, multicellular organisms, to start to arise on the surface of the Earth. Of course, it's possible that none of these things was mutually exclusive. It might be that a number of these factors occurred at the same time. The rise in oxygen might have allowed for aerobic respiration, complex multicellular organisms, and that might have also helped trigger genetic changes within organisms that allowed them to exploit these new potentials. So perhaps a number of things contributed to the rise of multicellular life that were interconnected. But once multicellular life did arise, why was it selected for? Why did it persist? Well, there are a number of possibilities. First of all, once organisms became multicellular, they became larger. And some sort of arms race may have occurred between organisms. Larger organisms would have evolved to eat smaller organisms. Then there would have been a selection pressure, a Darwinian selection pressure, for organisms to get larger, to eat those new predators, and so on and so forth. An arms race becomes established as organisms become larger and more complex to deal with the new biological environment in which they're living. Cellular specialization can also lead to increases in efficiency, some cells being specialized for locomotion, other cells being specialized to generate energy, and so on and so forth. This specialization, this division of labor in the way in which cells operated, might itself have increased the survival um, potential of life in particular environments. Multicellular organisms may also have been able to develop better physical protection from the environment. We can think about things like shells and skeletons that allow life to, uh, to move around, to protect itself from physical extremes, to escape physical extremes. So multicellularity would have led to, um, would have led to advantages in living in the natural environment. And finally, computational advantages. As you get more complex organisms, as they become multicellular, you can get more complex behaviours. You can appreciate that the behaviour of a dog is more complex than the behaviour of a microbe, for instance. So multicellular organisms can do things like run away from physical stresses, run away from dangers in the environment, these computational advantages that allow life to live in a complex world and increases its, increase its chances of uh, survival. All of these things would have allowed multicellular life to have been successful on the Earth. And once it had emerged, selection pressures, evolutionary selection pressures, would have allowed that multicellular life to persist and give rise to the diversity of multicellular life that we see on the Earth today. We know that uh, at about 542 million years ago, this uh, complex multicellular life was well established. How do we know that? Well, as life became more complex, as multicellular life began to diversify, some of these creatures began to produce skeletons, bones, and also shells. And bones and shells are much more easy to preserve in the rock record than soft tissues. So complex multicellular life with skeletons and shells is well preserved in the rock record and begins to give us the first unequivocal evidence that complex multicellular life had begun to emerge on the Earth at about 540 million years ago. And this period where we start to see these multicellular organisms rapidly increasing in the rock record is called the Cambrian Explosion, literally because of an explosion, a vast increase in the number of preserved multicellular organisms in that rock record. It would be very easy to think of the history of life as a very simplified thing. We start off with unicellular organisms and then the emergence of multicellular life and a gradual increase in the complexity and diversity of that multicellular life. But that wouldn't be true. In fact, we look in the rock record, we can see that there have been mass extinctions, periods in Earth history where large percentages of these organisms have literally been laid waste. In the rock record, we notice five mass extinctions, and some people even think our current time, because of the scale of human impact on the biosphere, is a sixth mass extinction. During these periods of mass extinction, diversity is reduced, but then picks up again afterwards. In fact, interestingly, after many of these mass extinctions, diversity has increased after these extinction events. What has caused them? Well, they're very controversial. For example, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs went extinct, is thought to have been caused by an asteroid or comet impact on the surface of the Earth. 
That asteroid or comet impact would have lofted dust into the atmosphere, shutting out sunlight. When the sunlight shut down, it would have prevented photosynthesis. Plant life would have died off, uh, removing the source of food for many organisms, multicellular organisms, on the surface of the Earth. And as a result, food webs would have crashed and many organisms would have gone extinct. Other mass extinctions might have been caused by massive volcanoes, changes in the chemistry of the oceans, changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere. So there are many uh, mechanisms by which mass extinctions might have been caused, and it's one of the great, the great interesting areas of astrobiology is to try and unravel the causes of these mass extinctions by looking at the geological, geochemical, environmental changes that might have occurred that are recorded in the record from which we might be able to ascertain what caused these mass extinctions in the past. But we should also remember that mass extinctions have created um, opportunities for life. Uh, the death of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago undoubtedly opened the way for the rise of mammals and eventually to us, and eventually the rise of human uh, intelligence and an intelligence on the surface of the Earth. So mass extinctions can change the course of biology and also create new potentials and new possibilities for the emergence of new, uh, new forms of life. So what have we learned in this lecture? Well, we've learned that for the first three billion years of history, life on Earth, uh, life was essentially unicellular, microbial. And then we begin to see, about 580 million years ago, the emergence of the first multicellular organisms in the rot record, strange, enigmatic shapes of organisms that suggest early experiments in body plans. We don't fully understand why this happened. It could have been changes in the genetics, genetic information of organisms. It could have been changes in the environment, the rise of oxygen. It could have been multiple reasons that came together and created the right uh, time, the right conditions for multicellular life to arise. We've looked at some of the advantages of multicellularity, size and specialization that would have been very successful traits for organisms trying to make a living on a planet with many challenges. And we saw that in the rock record, about 530, 540 million years ago, a sudden sharp rise in the preservation of multicellular organisms because of hard body parts that were preserved in the rocks and give us an indication that multicellular life was well on its way to becoming one of the dominant forms of life on the planet. And we've also seen how this rise of multicellular life has not been continuous. It's been punctuated by mass extinctions that have wiped out large percentages of this life. But after these mass extinctions, the diversity of life has continued to increase, leading to our present-day biosphere. It's even thought that our present activity in the biosphere might be another type of extinction event. 